This live stream is brought to you by Still and Evergreen Garden Care. Still is Australia's most trusted brand of garden power tools, backed by 95 years of German engineering excellence. To get your hands on their range, visit your local Still dealer today or visit still.com.au. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the best-known and trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. To be inspired and easily create and maintain your garden, head to lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail-order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on The Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hello, welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Trevor Cochran. Now, it's a beautiful Monday morning, albeit very smoky over here in the West. And guess what happened just as I got started? Um, now, the the day itself here is, is, being, is going to be quite warm. And it's been a really unusual um, period of time for, for us in the West. A lot of rain, a lot of warm days, a uh, few cool days. Same's been going on in other states. I know the same things uh, have happened in Victoria. And this affects gardens quite differently. So the stories that we'll talk about or the questions that you'll raise today in some instances are affected by these weather conditions. We can talk about why as we go along. Now, of course, today is all about you asking questions about your garden and giving you a chance to get an insight into good ideas, things that you should be doing. And uh, we'll be streaming this, of course, live through the Garden Gurus Facebook page, but also the Still Facebook page, the Love the Garden Facebook page. We've also got Garden Express's Facebook page. And don't forget, we've got people who are tuning in from our YouTube channel from all over the world, which is fabulous. Uh, today's show, I'll talk to my mate, David Van Berkel. Now he's got uh, the Garden Express offer of the week. They've got a pretty significant festival going on over there at the moment and I uh, can't wait to share a little bit of that with you. David's always a very, very insightful guy to chat with. Um, I was able to catch up with Love the Garden's Andrew O'Carrigan uh, to talk about citrus and there's probably no more popular fruit coming through right at the moment, right across the country than citrus. He's got some great ideas and we are heading well into autumn now. Things are really starting to happen. You've got a lot of things going on, a lot of pruning, you're starting to see the leaves drop, and all of that leaves you with a lot of organic matter. And I'll show you some, well, some ways to take that organic matter and turn it into garden gold. Of course, this week we've got prizes to give away. A little bit different this week. We do have our Fothergill seeds, so four of those. Plus, we've got these fantastic silicon seed raising punnets. They are absolutely brilliant. And they're reusable. It's a really clever little idea from the guys at um, at Mr. Fothergill. So we'll have those for the best questions. And of course, 
Lockie will be um, selecting those, so throw your best ones at us. We've got Steve working on the technical side of things for us at the moment, um, so things should all go nice and smoothly. Now, one more thing, when you do ask your questions, make sure you tell us the city where you're from or the state and the town that you live in so that I can kind of get an idea of what sort of conditions you're going through environmentally. A very first question today comes from Townsville in Queensland. Cheryl, hello. And Cheryl's actually given us a photograph, which is a fabulous way, if um, if you're not sure, um, of what's going on to describe it. If I can see a photo, I can help you. You can see this is a granadilla. Now, granadillas are tropical passion fruit, and they get the size sometimes of a football. They can be huge, but they're always like a football. And this one is not, and she's wondering why they are looking like they are. Now, it's not all of them, it's just a couple of them. And you'll sometimes see this happen with pumpkins as well. And it actually gets down to the pollination of the fruit. Now, interesting thing with granadillas is that they're, they're pollinated more by moth and also by ants than they are by bees. So um, one of those things where if the pollination is not quite right, sometimes um, you'll get this distorted fruit. And you've got two of them, but you've probably got another 20 fruit on the vine that are perfect. And it's it's okay. There's no, it's not a pest or a disease. It's simply just a pollination issue. Now, Lee, you didn't tell us where you're from. Be lovely to know, but you've got a pot recently that you bought into uh, your courtyard area and it was loaded with snails. Um, now you've got a problem with them uh, in both your herb pots and your garden beds. How can you remove them without harmful chemicals? So you've got two cats. Well, look, there's a couple of different things you can do. And copper is probably the key. So snails are mollusks and mollusks have no tolerance to copper. So snails and slugs in particular are really affected by copper being applied. So if you were to use bluestone uh, and maybe crush it up and put it in some of your pots, you'll find that the snails will very quickly disappear. It's a nice, safe way to do it. You don't want to put too much, but just a small amount, and that'll do the job. Valerie, again, we're not sure where you're from. Your lawn seems to have little swirly mud piles appearing all over it. It's very moist and soft to work on. Um, do you have some sort of bug under the lawn pushing the mud up? And the answer is you don't have a bug. You probably have earthworms, significant earthworms. As we move into the autumn, if your soil is quite heavy, you'll start to see this, these little mud piles, which are worm castings coming to the surface. It's actually the worms coming up and doing their business. At the same time, they're actually fertilizing and aerating the soil. So it's not really a bad thing. And all I would suggest you do is just grab a fine leaf rake and get out there and give it a little bit of a rake over and you'll find everything is fantastic. Now, keep throwing your questions at us, but right at this moment, I wanted to talk to my mate, David Van Berkel, because David, apart from living in one of the most beautiful parts of the world, he has one of the best businesses because, well, he gets to work with lots of different plants, lots of different growers, he grows his own stuff. I don't know whether it gets any better than that, David. Good morning to you. Good morning, Trevor. How are you going? I'm exceptional. You are uh, you look like you're in the boardroom or something today, David. You're looking very swish. I got out of the dungeon and, uh, yeah, in a slightly bigger space, so excuse the echo if there's one. No, it's all good. It's all good, mate. We can hear loud and clear. David, um, how's Flower Fest going? You know, Flower Fest, you launched, really you launched it, I suppose, last year um, as a result of COVID. Went gangbusters because I think we're, we all were suffering from pent-up frustration of being locked up. Not as big a deal this year as far as being locked up, but gardening's still bigger than ever, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, a newfound activity for a lot of people uh, and then, for everybody else who's always been a gardener, you know, it's just a really fun time of year coming into autumn. So, uh, yeah, Flower Fest, bigger and better this year, I think, than last year and, and having a lot of fun. So tell me, what, what does it mean? What's Flower Fest mean uh, for those people that are sitting in Perth or Adelaide or, or in Queensland? You know, typically um, Mifcus was this event where Victorians and those visitors to Victoria were extremely spoilt. You went, you set up these spectacular displays at Mifcus at the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show. But you, you know, for those, uh, the rest of us that couldn't make it, we missed out, but we don't have to anymore. You, you always miss out, you know, and it's, it's something really interesting that's come of, of COVID is that we're able to present all of those great things that we uh, took down to the show, you know, a, a massive festival from our point of view, lots of fun meeting lots of customers, uh, but, again, only those that came to uh, to the flower show. So, 
a little bit revolutionary in the sense that we thought, well, why don't we bring these offers to everybody, um, which we've been doing for the last couple of weeks, Trevor. So tell me a little bit about this office. You know, Mother's Day is not far away, so it'd be a good time to be investing in some uh, some gifts. And the great thing about Garden Express is whatever you buy online at Flower Fest, of course, it's delivered direct to your doorstep. Exactly. So uh, with Mother's Day coming up, there's lots of different gifts that you can uh, give your mother from some of our beautiful bulbs, uh, lovely plants. We've got some chrysanthemums uh, coming online. Uh, okay. But this week we've got some um, some great tools. You know, my signature tools that we introduced uh, about eighteen months ago. Uh, very very popular. Uh, really good quality stainless steel, and we're offering them at fifty percent off, Trevor. Wow, David, I, I was literally on the weekend. Uh, somebody wrote into us after watching the Garden Gurus on Channel Nine, and said, "Listen, those those Garden Express, those Van Burkle hand tools and and digging tools." Where do I get my hands on them? And, uh, well, of course, we were steering them straight back to you, but uh, hopefully they're taking advantage of those discounts. That, that's a massive deal. So those that hand tool kit was about $98, $99, if I remember correctly, and now what, $58.90? $58.90 with a bonus uh, set of secretaires for, uh, for Mother's Day, Trevor. And those secretaires are fantastic. The ones with the wooden handles, right? Wooden handles, yeah, quite heavy and, again, stainless steel. Uh, a really beautiful, comfortable feel, um, and and those wooden handles to me, you know, those types of tools, they're just uh, really natural for the garden. They can soak up a bit of the moisture and uh, and the dirt that goes with it clean really easily. Um, just yeah, it feels really comfortable. Yeah, they're they're beautiful tools. Um, the digging tools are exceptional too. Stainless steel digging tools make the world a difference, and that was another huge saving. That was about two hundred bucks. Oh, 190 is that right um to, to buy yeah, that for the uh for the large fork and the and the spade with the uh with the ashwood handles yeah yep. so they're normally 200 dollars trevor we got them for 99. wow so it's a massive saving now the other thing that we introduced as a and it was totally thanks to you um you introduced me to the bucket barrow this i've never seen you know the last innovation i saw in a wheelbarrow was probably about 25 years ago and suddenly bucket barrow came out tell us a little bit about that one uh, Michael invented this barrow. Michael was a uh, he was a builder, constantly on the building site, you know, trudging over those small beams to get up into a house and yep. uh, moving from concrete and whatever. Uh, and so he decided to to build one for the building trade. And and then his wife said, "Well, this is actually even better for for around the garden. You can take some water, you can take some plants, you keep your gloves dry." So the little uh, buckets that come with the wheelbarrow uh, are just fantastic and. I know at my place, the buckets are all over the place. They're bright, they're orange. I use them as markers when I'm getting some more mobs delivered. Just yep. find the orange <laughs> orange bucket. Um, Great idea. It's fabulous, yeah. Mate, that's brilliant. Um, so, But you've got a Gardener's Advantage bucket barrow giveaway going, right? We have valued at 350, Trevor. We've thrown in a few, uh, some kneeling pads and a few other Garden Advantage accessories that you need around the garden. And for everybody that buys from the Flower Fest, automatically goes into the draw for one of three of the Bucket Barrow Gardener's Vantage prizes. Three. Wow, that's huge. Now, tell me something. I just You just triggered something. It, it is we're moving into bulb planting season and those kneeling pads, they are gold when you're out putting your, your daffs and your tulips and your John quills in, aren't they? Uh, mate, we've got two styles, so the ones that strap around your knees and yep. also just the oval-shaped uh, kneeler that's a little bit easier to sort of transport around. Um, but yep. with the memory foam, Trevor, it's super comfortable and, and in a range of colours, you know, some nice bright colours down through to browns and blacks to deal with the dirt a little bit better. I'll have to get some orders in for those too because, uh, yeah, I, it's the one thing that I'm really conscious of as I get out and start planting those bulbs is, uh, you know, it's the old knees for me as I'm getting older now that get sore after a while. So um, that's great, David. You know what, if people want to get their hands on it, how do they do it? Uh, straight to the website, www.gardenexpress.com.au. Fantastic. David Van Burkle, thanks so much for your support and for joining us again this week. Look forward to seeing you next week, mate. Great talking to you, Trevor. Looking slick too, by the way, my friend. Looking very slick. Way to go. Have a great afternoon. <laughs> you too. All right, All right. So I'll get into some, some questions going on here. We've got some coming through. Speaking of Melbourne, Donna is in Melbourne. She's got a sick 
a sick looking indoor plant called fruit salad by the greenhouse and the leaves are going brown. Now that is monstera and monstera will grow outdoors and will grow indoors. But if it's been indoors for a long period of time and you move it outdoors, the leaves will go brown. They will burn in the sun. And the next lot of leaves that come through will be a lot harder. Now you've watered it once a week and you've given it some indoor fertilizer. So some advice, please. If you can leave it outside, um, there's, there's three locations. These will grow in full sun. They do grow ideally under the shade of a tree. And the other one is, of course, inside the house. And uh, I know last week we talked to Wallex and uh, I know with the Wallex story, they had a variegated um, fruit cellar plant. Now, by the way, it's called the fruit cellar plant because it's not just a beautiful indoor plant. It actually produces these big, long, um, they almost look like they're corn pieces, they're, they're fruit, and it progressively ripens as it comes down. And the flavour of the fruit is very much like the, the old tinned fruit salad that you would get. It's a kind of a tangy mix between pineapple, um, crunchy with pear and sweet like that as well. So really cool little um, plant to, um, to grow at home. And don't worry, Donna, uh, it will come back. It will grow new foliage. I would water it with liquid fertiliser now probably every week for the next three or four weeks and then uh, give it some controlled release and it will just recover. It should be fine. Maz is in Ipswich. Hello, Maz. Maz joins us on a regular basis. It's great to have you back with us this week. Um, I hope sunny Queensland is as beautiful as it always is. Could you please tell me which soil I need to grow key apples in and how long does it take them to fruit? So the key apple is a South African uh, plant. It produces um, these huge spines. It's one of the best um, protection plants. So if you've got an area where you don't want people passing through, maybe along a fence and there's a risk somebody could jump over the fence, they'll never jump over into the key apple or they'll never walk through the key apple because those thorns will literally tear you to pieces. But it produces fruit. And this fruit is actually a crunchy, small uh, fruit with a texture very similar to an apple, hence its name. The answer to them producing fruit really depends on the conditions that you've got. They actually produce fruit generally when they've gone through a hot, dry spell. So normally it would take two to three years for them to get to a size where they're going to produce a crop that's worth taking notice of. And as far as soil goes, it just needs to be free draining soil. As long as it doesn't get too heavy and too waterlogged, uh, that will do really, really well. Hopefully that helps. Uh, let's go to Macedon in Victoria. Hello, Linda. Um, you're looking for suggestions. Re a white winter flowering ground cover that will tolerate full sun and is frost hardy. Well, we could split this in half. We could talk about Myoporums, the Bubiana, which is a native plant and produces wonderful little white flower, uh, or white flowers right across it. And they tend to come through in the winter and in the spring. Um, and it's full sun and frost hardy. So that, that's a simple solution. If you're looking for something that's exotic, that's got white flowers, you might want to think about uh, the Chinese um, Chinese star jasmine, uh, Trachylus spermum. Now that one produces clusters of little white flowers that are highly fragrant. And uh, again, frost hardy, it, it'll, it'll be fine. Um, grows in full sun, will also grow in shade. So there's two options for you. Janice, you're in Charmhaven in New South Wales. Hello. When using a slow release fertilizer, is it best to remove the mulch? Or can I directly put the fertilizer on top of the mulch? So there's sometimes we get things a little bit confused between slow release and controlled release. So slow release tends to be things like animal manures. And what happens is they break down over a period of four, six or eight weeks, slowly releasing nutrients as they're breaking down and they do improve the soil. Controlled release tends to be those prills like Osmocote that slowly releases nutrients over three to say six month period, sometimes nine months. And what you do with both of them um, will determine how effective they are. So if you put the controlled release, that's the prills, the Osmocote on top of the soil, it's a little more exposed to uh, temperature conditions. And it's called Osmocote because it releases through osmosis. So that's effectively atmospheric pressure, um, condensing, crushing and expanding. And as it expands, it opens the little pores in the prills and they release a little bit of nutrient that's in, in solution inside out. So when you get hot weather, um, you'll find those pores are open a lot and it tends to release more. When you've got cooler weather, um, it might release very little, but the plants might be growing quite slowly. So 
my view is that the controlled release is always the preferred option when it comes to feeding. But when it comes to feeding and getting uh, improving your soil, um, the animal manures tend to be the best option. There's two choices there. You don't need to remove the mulch for either one of them. I hope I explained that um, easily enough and that you understand exactly what I'm trying to say. Um, both of them are good. Both do just slightly different things. Uh, but certainly as far as feeding goes, you tend to find controlled release fertilizers like Osmocote are so much better. Now, Keng is a, is a regular friend joining us. Good morning to you, Keng. He's in Perth. I'd like to know how to, uh, how do I, how do I keep my big pots of edible ginger and pandan plants warm during the winter months? Okay, well, this is a pretty good question. These are both tropical plants. Um, edible ginger tends to, in my, so I'm, I'm in the Perth Hills, so it's a lot cooler where we are. Uh, it tends to die back down. The pandan will go through winter where I live relatively well albeit it's never as good as it would be in its in its tropical environment that it would normally naturally come from. The simplest way to do this is to jump on um, jump online and get yourself one of those, um, and, and Garden Express are probably the first stop that I would go to, get yourself one of those mini greenhouses because you can literally put it over the top. Um, you can use the solar heat going through the greenhouse to keep them warm and it holds the heat and humidity in through the winter months it will also protect them from uh, some from from frost so there's there's a bit to consider there but my view is that um the longer that they're in the ground the longer they're in the environment the more they acclimatize and adapt and the better they get at surviving those conditions anyway so a little bit of protection is probably a good thing through the coldest of the months which would be july and august um, but maybe year two, you might not need to do that. Or year three, you might not need to do that. You just need to watch. One of the great things about gardening is that plants will tell you what's going on. You just have to be looking. So just make sure you go for a walk through your garden on a regular basis. It's something I love doing. Now, let me talk to you about a brand new product that um, I've just done some work with. And the reason I've done it is because winter and autumn in particular is when I get out and prune a lot of, I've got a lot of plants that require pruning that time of the year. And when you think about it, winter is when you're pruning fruit trees, when you're pruning roses, autumn is when you're seeing a lot of leaf litter and certainly deciduous trees. As you start to sh see the trees and you can look through them, shaping them up, collecting green waste, all that material is valuable resource. And too many of us take that, put it in a skip bin or in the green bin or the yellow bin and send it off to the tip. And it's such a waste. All the energy that you put into your plants through the spring and the summer, the fertilizer, the water, the love, the care, all of that has gone into that foliage. And when you remove it, it's still a rich source of two or three things. So I've just done this story where I've talked about not throwing that material away, but putting it through a shredder. And that shredder um, is one that I got from Still. It's the GHE 150. Really fabulous thing. It, it's one that you actually plug into a um, into a power cord, so it's a, it's electric, but it's just so easy to move in and around the garden. And the safety features with shredders these days is absolutely sensational. It's one of the reasons why I love this. You cannot hurt yourself as long as you follow the instructions. Um, these kinds of kinds of tools, particularly this kind of this time of the year, are really valuable. So. With Mother's Day just around the corner, if you're thinking about getting mum a tool that's going to keep the garden looking fabulous, and I mean fabulous, it improves the soil, it keeps carbon in the soil, uh, you know, it stops green um, greenhouse gases being produced out of landfill. There's so many good messages with this. One of these still GHE 150 shredders, fantastic investment. And the only place you can get them is from a still dealer. So still are a family-owned company, uh, started in Germany, been very big in Australia for a long period of time, and it's the brand that the professional industry trusts. And there's a reason why we trust it, and that is because they are built tough. And so this is not something that you're going to plug in, you're going to get three uses out of, and it's going to burn out. This is something that will last for years and years and years. And as I said, the safety features with this means that you could not hurt yourself if you tried. It really is a fabulous tool. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, 
you're thinking about the the waste that you're producing now and thinking about ways that you can better use it and certainly with all of this green waste and, and as i said right at the moment i've got um flowers that are finishing they've gone through it i've got leaves that we're collecting they've actually gone through it doesn't really make a huge difference it just tears them up but it reduces the particle size and all of this down quite considerably and why that's important is that when you put it through a shredder and the particle size is small um, it makes a, a better mulch a better compost a lot quicker um, oxygen is a very important thing when it comes to breaking down microbes actually use oxygen as they break the the green waste down and if you can throw in and here's a little tip for you if you can throw in uh, maybe a handful of urea um, it, for every say cubic meter of uh, of green waste you've got they will take that nitrogen out of that very very quickly and convert it in the process of breaking it down and this just means that instead of waiting six to nine months for your compost from the material you've got you'll get it all in three months maximum and that three months means that come springtime instead of you buying compost and mulch you'll actually have a big pile of it and that's why i'm suggesting now's the time to be doing it but if you if you're doing it with large particles and chop and drop you know that's a a fundamental thing um with regards to uh gardening you know a lot of people believe in that and that's because you're keeping the carbon from the organic material in the soil it's a really good thing to do but making a really good compost that's the way you do it you shred it down so shred it into smaller particles and then mix a little bit of urea in there then you can do one of two things you can either just let it compost down or you can layer it as a green mulch over the top of soil and this is going to help smother weeds as well so many tips so many good ideas and a brilliant product one that you can only get from your local steel dealer i hope that helps um now thought we might just quickly have a quick talk to nige or a quick look at what nige is up to with regards to the garden gurus coming up this week This Saturday on The Garden Gurus, I'm going to help you get your lawn singing with plenty of nutrients and help you save water and fix any water repellency, hydrophobia issues you may have. It's this Saturday, folks, on The Garden Gurus. For some of you, this could be a life-changing event. You know, when it comes to um, stressed lawns, nobody knows how to look after them better than Nigel Ruck. When it comes to lawns, Nigel is the man. And um, that was a great tip. But you'll see a lot more of it coming up this weekend on The Garden Gurus. It's on Channel 9, Saturdays at 4.30pm, right across the country. So make sure you don't miss it. Now, let's have a look. I wanted to talk to you about my plant of the week, but I've kind of got two of them. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. Have a look at this. This beautiful big white flower and this huge stem right you can see how long that stem is that comes from a plant called the sea lily and my sea lilies are just coming into flower right now and you do get a few different forms you've got the pure white like this you've got one that's got a beautiful pink stripe through it and then you've got some that are actually pink in in color themselves they're different varieties but they're all something that you should be looking are planting in your garden now and take a look at the size of that and how many flowers are being produced so the one thing about this is there's one two three four five six seven flowers currently and these will last for about two days maybe three then on the inside you can see all those buds coming through well there'll be another seven and they'll come through to replace these guys and it'll do it probably another two times after that. It just keeps producing flower buds out of the middle of the stem. And then it'll produce a great big seed pod. It'll be about four or five of them. They turn bright orange. They're quite ornamental as well. This is an almost indestructible lily. It is huge. They get to probably, the plant itself can be as tall as five, six foot in height. So 1.8 meters is probably not an unusual height for these to grow to. And if you've got a spot in the garden where you want to have that big lush foliage effect, then this is certainly the plant you grow. Now, I'm not bragging, but take a look at those 
They are dailies. They came from Garden Express. They are absolutely fantastic. And I love them. And they're going into a vase here in the office. But before I go putting them in the vase, I'm going to strip some of this foliage. And there's a very important reason why. I'm going to show you what I mean. So they look great. But on closer inspection, have a look at that foliage. Can you see the white on there? And if I'm to reverse it around, you probably won't be able to identify it. You can see some silvering there. Okay, now the silvering has been caused by a russet mite, believe it or not. So they've got mites. Um, the mites are in a, a war at the moment with some beneficial insects I have in the garden. So I've been really reticent to spray them, but I'm probably going to have, have to hit them with a little bit of wettable sulfur. The white on that side of the leaf, that is actually a good sign that we are a lot moisture, moister than we normally would be in my garden because I'd never have this normally occur. And that it's the time of the year that these plants will start to finish flower and start to die back. Of course, dahlias do die back during the winter. Um, that is powdery mildew. And mildews are pretty common when you've got lots of moisture, particularly at night, and it sits on foliage for a long period of time. And that's exactly what's been going on because we've had so much rain here in Perth. So there's not a lot I can do about it. We are coming to the end of the season. So I'm, I'm going to roll with the punches and just keep harvesting the flowers and putting them in vases. But um, this might be something I actually have to watch out for next year. And the reason why I do is because often when you get the spores of these kinds of fungal infections, and if, you, if I've got any of these mites that are here, there's russet mite. There's also, we've got this thing called chili mite over here in the West and Western flower thrip is another one. All of these guys are pretty active, but what happens is as the weather gets cool, they tend to go down and lay their eggs in the soil around the base of the plant. And um, as soon as the weather warms up, those eggs hatch, and those, those adults emerge and start eating your favourite plants again. So I'm going to have to think about strategies with regards to controlling it. And IPM, Integrated Pest Management, is my preferred option at the moment. And that does allow me to spray a little bit of... Um, wettable sulfur around. Wettable sulfur will knock those pests back a little bit. So I'm going to do that. It'll also help with that um, powdery mildew. If you've got those kinds of problems, you need to be writing into us and asking your questions. If you can share photos, even better. And um, what I would recommend you do is make sure you tell us your suburb, your state, your suburb address or town, and it'll help me in answering your questions. Now, Nikki is in Concurry in Queensland. And she's looking at putting a feature tree in around the pool area. And what would some good options be, please? Now, it depends on what sort of tree you want. If you love natives, there's some absolute rippers. And, and some of the ones that I love the most are the brachychitans, the, the various forms of the yellow warrior flame tree, I suppose, is the best way to describe them. They really are just stunning plants, really beautiful, small trees. Downside is they tend to have quite a root system. So you don't want them too close to your pool. You want to keep them... A little bit further back if you can. If it was me, I would be thinking about things like frangipanis. I'd also be thinking about things like golden shower tree, but not hanging over the pool, just set back from the pool. I hope that makes sense. Um, that might answer some of your questions. Now, I did catch up with Andrew O'Carrigan. Andrew is one of those very talented people from Love the Garden, the guys at Evergreen. And we had a chat about citrus because citrus are obviously producing a lot of fruit at the moment and how you care for them is very important. And here's what Andrew had to say. Hello, Andrew. How are you going? Good, Trevor. Great to be here again. Thanks very much for inviting us along. That's all right. Now, tell us a little bit about the weather over there just at the moment. All of us gardeners love to know what's going on with the weather. How is it there? So East Coast uh, two weeks ago was smashed with rain, record rainfalls, record floods. Uh, fast forward to today and we're absolutely smashing sunshine. We've got 24 degrees and crystal blue skies and it's just got that tinge of autumn Christmas and tomorrow I think 27. So we're starting to creep up again in temperature and, and this is just meaning great things for gardens, probably for weeds as well, but for our plants, we're all loving it at the moment. And, and these conditions are actually very good for plants, but, you know, for them to be able to grow coming out of um, what was a, a warm, wet summer in a lot, a lot of the country, um, they need to be boosted along, don't they? They need to be given yeah. some support. Otherwise, they don't, if they don't have those nutrients, they don't have the energy, and therefore you don't see the results. 
Yeah, look, um, in general, when you build a garden, it's uh, an unnatural situation for a lot of plants and they do uh, best by regular feeding. And so don't be afraid to think that as the weather's cool and you might back off your feeding, it's important to sort of get that autumn feed into to action now and think about your winter preparation as well. So it's a perfect time to add some nutrition. And, and it's because I think also those moisture levels tend to be a lot better in soils this time of the year that you get all the microbial activity. It, it's, it's alive, isn't it? It's really buzzing. Oh, absolutely. The, the soil's going to still retain quite a bit of warmth um, as we head into sort of the months of about May uh, and June. It does tend to taper off in the east coast around that sort of June-July period where there's less activity, but still think of your soils being alive and needing food, and when you apply that food, the warmth with the microbes and that will start to break it down quite quickly. Andrew, this is where, like, the science behind what you guys do has really come to the fore. And, uh, you know, once upon a time, I remember potting mixes um, were predominantly sort of composted sawdust of some sort, usually with some iron sulfate thrown in to make it turn black pretty quickly. Um, yeah. It really wasn't super well composted. But what we found was that the poor old home gardener, when they took that bag of potting mix home and planted into that, it, it didn't work super well. It took a while for that, that soil to develop its own, you know, I suppose it's soil biology and its life to really start to spring forth and, and support the plant's growth. Yeah. You, you guys... Um, when you look at something now, whether it be creating a soil or creating a fertiliser, you're looking at multiple ingredients that do specific things, aren't you? Yeah, we certainly are. Look, uh, we're, we've got a commitment to every bag that we send out that it has the right quality, and that means a well-composted, well-arranged blend of ingredients. Um, some ingredients we do find we've struggled with through the, the height of COVID with the uptake of gardening, but... To counter that, we make sure that we um, manage that nutrition that's in the product so that if there is some decline from a product which is not desirable, it will actually balance out with the right rates of osmocote and other trace minerals that you need to grow the plant. And, and you've kind of this, uh, at least one product owner that you've created that is is completely unique, um, Nature In. Yeah, we've, uh, we've come to market with Performance Naturals and it contains what we um, have tried to patent as the brand uh, Nature N, and that Nature N allows us to have a really good upfront um, nitrogen profile for our organic pellets. And so people are very familiar with using organic pellets. Uh, they do have a good slow release action quite naturally. Um, they do often contain low amounts of nitrogen. So this uh, Nature N gives a really fast, high upfront soluble nitrogen. And that's really what drives uh, great healthy plants in pots and in ground. And yep. When you combine that with those organics, you get a beautiful release over the, the period, sometimes up to three months, which is what we push with our products. And with nitrogen, that steady release is vitally important for plant growth because it provides not a short burst of energy and short burst of growth, but actual a sustained growing period, which is so much better for the plant. They're so much stronger and, and healthier as a result. Yeah, so we build a product to... Uh, work on those range of nitrogen profiles and you get various um, release curves as we call it with different types of minerals so if you think of blood meal that's quite fast but also has a tail end to it as well yep. chicken manure it has um, a good upfront release is quite short and other ingredients like feather meal they can actually be really slow to release that nitrogen but then have a good tail effect for up to three months and so when we build the products we'll we'll make the arrangement depending on the, the type of plant group we're trying to support and the type of effect we want the consumer to have. And, and you know, it, was, it's, it feels like it's very, very new that, you know, when we talk about a good soil, that, that potting mix has had biostimulants put into it. Mm. What, what does that mean? Yeah, biostimulants is something that I think has sprung up as a great term for the, uh, the general consumer, but it's been um, very well understood through agriculture and horticultural science for years. And so your um, microbes needing to be fed in the soil, they often need stimulants. And that can come in a range of natural forms. So you can have things such as seaweed. Um, that's a classic sort of stimulant that people are aware of. Um, but then you can also use things in the inorganic range um, of fertilisers such as urea. And they're all stimulants. So nitrogen is basically the key driver of all 
plant life on Earth and human human life. And so you need uh, various amounts of minerals. And these nitrogens are the stimulants for the soil. They come in various forms. You know, um, there's, there's about three things, I think, that sit on the top of the list of most important things for people when they're, when they're buying a mix of any sort. And one of them is, uh, if it's a potting mix, they obviously want to make sure that um, it's as organic as possible, it's as natural as possible. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. The, the second one is that they actually get results from it. And the third one that's really come to the fore in the last few years has been this really holistic look at sustainability, and particularly the recycling of a plastic bag, because there are millions of potting mix bags go into the market every year. And once upon a time, those bags weren't recyclable, but you guys are doing a lot of work in that space, aren't you? Yep, uh, we've got a technology specialist for packaging at our company, and he's working with our uh, suppliers to look at different streams of plastic they can blend in. Um, we're up to 50% with uh, some of the new performance natural packaging that's coming out for growing media. Wow. And then for all our packaging in growing media, all the plastic film, uh, there is the ability to take that back to red cycle. So there are different um, outlets across Australia where your packaging, if it's being used, so dirty packaging as well, can be bundled up and put into the bin. So it's a great sustainability initiative and we'd love all our customers to get behind that. And as we progress to get better at um, inclusion of recycled content, we'll increase that rate as high as we can to 100%. It's a, it's a fantastic initiative. Um, it's it's just what many you guys have got, though, isn't it? It's, you, you've come up with a lot of terrific environmental niches. I, I know things like solar power on some of your buildings and things like that now. You're really looking at things holistically as a company. It's the overlay in everything that we do now. There's a sustainability initiative to every aspect that we think of in our in our business and for the, the end product. Um, we've got an objective now that we're bringing out more and more naturals or organic um, certifiable products in, in each release each year. So uh, that's putting a lot of pressure on finding new, uh, unique and well-developed ideas and making sure that they still work with the ethos to the company and making sure they perform for the consumer at the end of the day. It's pretty exciting. There's, there's one thing that I think is um, really, I suppose, relevant right at the moment is that right across the country, everybody's got citrus trees that are uh, producing fruit yeah. all over the country. And getting the best result from, from fruit and citrus hasn't always been easy, but your performance naturals, you've developed a product specifically to cater for, for these types of trees, haven't you? Yes, we have. Um, so performance naturals has uh, three in its range and your purpose, uh, tomato, veg, and the fruit and citrus. So the fruit and citrus we know uh, is really important for its formulation to help um, get beautiful leaf growth, mm -hmm. to get that deep green that you need to uh, help the plant grow and photosynthesize. But then we also know that you need those other elements such as good calcium levels, good magnesium. So we make sure that they're boosted within the plant. Um, you know, we do this in a combination package. So that uh, compressed pellet that is the right balance that if you feed your plant on a regular rotation, you should have um, perfect citrus plants coming into that, that harvest season. And that's, that's why you develop a product like this because you, you want the consumer to have the best outcome for their fruit crop. I think you know, citrus are the ultimate in honesty plants, I reckon, because <laughs> if, if you don't have your soil balance right, the nutrient balance right, they will show you. They'll curl their leaves, they'll curl them one way, they'll curl them the other way, they'll get, you know, yellow striping along the veins or deep dark green striping that they'll tell you exactly what it is they're missing. But it's vitally important for our own health to make sure that we've got all these nutrients in the soil right from the beginning, because if we're consuming that fruit, that that, that fruit from your citrus tree, you want to be getting all the goodness for it, don't you? And that's why it's so important to use a, a specialised fertiliser just like this. Totally. Um, everything you say is 100%. If you walked into an old garden that was neglected and you saw the citrus tree, it would probably have every known pest and disease on it. Um, they're great indicator plants for plant health. So they will, as you described, show you nutrient deficiency really easily. Um, they'll also attract a lot of pests and seeds if they're not maintained well. So putting in the right amount of um, fertiliser is really important so you don't 
over fertilize the plant, but also the right balance of nutrition so that you get those elements which are really going to overcome the deficiencies and strengthen the cell walls, which is calcium, and also um, harden the root system and allow it to get deep down into the soil so they're more drought resistant. Uh, citrus tend to be quite shallow rooted and you don't want to disturb that root system. So they're in that plant family of rutaceae and they, they do like to be fed regularly. Um, but with little amounts so that you don't overstimulate the plant. And what we find is this formulation should work beautifully for that and help harden and set that fruit really nicely without a tough rind. Um, so that's exactly what you want from your citrus. Mate, you've done it again. Well done. Great, great advice <laughs> and, uh, and a brilliant product. I mean, look, seriously, yeah. we, we who, who garden professionally, we know... Um, you know, how good the products are that are coming out of Evergreen or the various brands that you've got. But this Performance Naturals range is just setting a whole new benchmark now and it's becoming the go-to and for a very good reason. Thanks for sharing it with us, mate. Legend, thanks, Trevor. You're always a great champion of the brand and the products and we just hope that the consumer understands and picks up on that and really enjoys it. Hello, what an interesting fellow he is. His knowledge is absolutely fantastic. And that's what this is all about, sharing our knowledge. Uh, for those of us that have worked in this industry, that love the industry, being able to share it with you guys out there who just love your gardens is an absolute privilege. And so um, that's why we're here to help answer your questions. You know, every once in a while, though, somebody asks a question and they get me. You know, they've got something that's just a little bit too difficult or Maybe my brain just can't quite think fast enough uh, through options. But Tala uh, from New South Wales came up with a ripper last week. She wanted to know a native climber that will bear edible fruit to grow over an arbour out on the farm. Uh, Tala followed up with a suggestion. She'd done a bit of research and uh, she suggested that the sweet native raspberry is an option. Not sure that it's going to grow big enough to go over an arbour, but it's certainly a fruit producing plant. It is a native uh, member of the raspberry family. That's one option. The option I had for you was the native passion fruit. Um, there's a few different forms of that available. Um, there's a few different species actually of that available, um, but all of them will actually grow in uh, in your backyard there in the tablelands uh, of New South Wales. Tell her the one thing I would suggest to you, it's worthwhile checking out a little online garden centre called um, called Daly's Fruit Nursery. Now, Daly's Fruit Tree Nursery or Fruit Nursery is purely online, but they do have a lot of those bush tucker plants that grow really well and produce different types of fruit. And I'm sure that if ever there was an option um, that might uh, be interesting for you. That's where you'll find it. We've got our good friend Christine joining us from Sterling in WA. Hello, Christine. You said your lawn is looking fantastic, but the old creeping oxalis is back. This has been a fantastic year for o the creeping oxalis, which has these little yellow flowers and sort of reddish kind of foliage. It's green and red, actually. Um, and it's really starting to take off. I've got it certainly in my lawns. And um, what it's doing currently is competing for nutrients and also uh, sunlight with the existing grass. So you do have to treat it. The way I treat it is with simple hose on weed and feed, but not the normal one. I use the buffalo one, just so you know. I hope that helps. Mowing can help, um, and uh, but really the, the best treatment at the moment is a selective herbicide spray now. Staying in Perth, my good friend Shazza has joined us. Hi, Shazza. Um, you've got some desert rose seeds. When's the best time to grow them? What potting mix would you use? I would use, there is a, a potting mix from um, Osmocote. It is designed for propagation. I think it's called the Osmocote propagation potting mix, but just double check it. But you'll find it in good garden centers, certainly your local bunning store. Now, the interesting thing about this is you use that mix and you lay the seeds over the top. Then ideally just get a little bit of coarse river sand and spread that over the top of the seeds water them down and you kind of do it now and they'll start to germinate. They'll germinate now, they'll grow into June. And if you get yourself a little propagation unit with a heating tray on the bottom, they'll continue to grow through winter. If not, they'll sit fairly dormant through June, July. As long as they stay dry, they're fantastic. And then in August, late August, certainly September, they start to grow away with new foliage and you'll get brand new plants. And the Desert Rose is an absolutely gorgeous plant. It's 
absolutely fantastic in pots. Uh, you can treat it like a bonsai. It's kind of got those swollen stems and it's got these beautiful big trumpety flowers. It's a distant relative of the oleander. So you do have to be careful how you handle it because um, there is a known toxicity with those plants. But um, the flowers themselves are just stunning. I hope that helps. Nikki's written into us, but we're not sure where you're from, Nikki. Any recommendations for cold tolerant outdoor shaded garden bed shrubs? Well, probably the single biggest thing that would make a big difference here is to tell us where you're from. And the reason that's important is because cold tolerant in Tasmania or Victoria is vastly different to cold tolerant in WA or in Brisbane, for example. So my suggestion to you is maybe you actually go down to your local garden centre, have a chat to them and say, look, I'm looking for some stuff to grow in some shaded beds. Um, just off the top of my head, if I was going to recommend anything, if you're in slightly warmer conditions, some of the native orchids, the dendrobiums, dendrobium kingianum is a good one, for example, are fabulous. They really grow well in that environment. And if you want something that's a little bit more exotic, um, then maybe look at some of the bromeliads. There's a whole range of them that will grow really well in that kind of environment. Uh, but again, it would help us if you told us where you're from. Um, Murthy is from Melbourne. Hello, Murthy. My cauliflower and broccoli leaves are being eaten. I pick away caterpillars, but some I've seen small crawling insects. How do I get rid of them? Tried insect sprays, but it's not working. My capsicum and eggplants didn't survive at all. Now, the capsicum and eggplant problem is probably something completely different to what's causing the broccoli um, and cauliflower issues. The little insects you're probably talking about is highly likely they're white fly. Now you can go and get yourself some of these predatory insects mailed to you. You can release them and they will eat away at the white flower and help control it. You could also use something like, like, uh, like um, wettable sulfur spray and that will also help uh, get a bit of control going on there. I'm really not sure uh, that there's too many other things. With caterpillars, things like Success, which is a biological or bioactive spray, that's uh, another one you can use. And it's probably going to be a combination of all of these that'll give you success to clean out all the pests in the garden. I hope that helps. Liz Murdy is uh, in my backyard and Lynette has written in to us. Uh, is there any way to control grasshoppers of all sizes from decimating the leaves on avocados, hibiscus, citrus, etc.? cetera? Um, you've had an explosion of little green nymphs, medium sized ones, the big locust ones you catch for the chooks. And the chooks are a great way to control uh, grasshoppers in a garden. So sometimes letting them out uh, because they'll get those little green nymphs. They'll love them more than they'll love the, the big guys. So that's one thing you can do. There is a bait. It's called David Gray's brand bait. Um, it's cricket and grasshopper controller, I think. You can spread that around and they will, uh, they'll go to that ahead of going to the avocado and hibiscus leaves. Hopefully that helps Lynette. Pauline is in Darwin. It's great to hear from you in Darwin. How do I stop the moth or beetle that lays its eggs in pots and the white grubs that are eating the roots and the plants are dying? Okay, so it sounds like you've got um, curl, curl grub. Uh, there is a product out there. It's um, something that you soak into, uh, you mix in a watering can, you soak into the ground and it will control curl grubs. Um, it's not so much the adult as much as the grub that's doing all the damage and probably the best thing to do is to get control of that. The product that you use um, will depend. You do need to go into your local garden centre to get your hands on it, uh, but it is a product from Bayer and um, and the name escapes me just at the moment. But, uh, yeah, just ask for... Uh, just ask for a control that you can actually soak the ground to control curl grubs. That'll fix it. Maz has come back from Ipswich. A follow-up on the key apple question. Do key, all key apples have spines? The answer is yes, they do. And you've got seedlings and you wanted to know whether uh, you've got male or female. Good point about that because key apples uh, produce male and female plants. So you do need multiples of them. Uh, generally, for every two, uh, sorry, for every three plants, you'll get two females and one male. And with the male, it produces flowers, but it won't produce fruit, whereas the females will produce copious amounts of fruit. One thing that I didn't mention is that key apples in hot, dry conditions tend to be compact shrubs, maybe get to two metres maximum in height. But in warm, tropical conditions, they can be a pest in Australia. So certainly uh, north of Sydney, 
you need to watch them and certainly north of Brisbane definitely watch them as far as not letting them get away now the trick with the with the bit with the warmer conditions also and, and moist soils is that the plants do get very very tall so treat them a little bit like a shrub so get in and hedge them back don't be scared to cut them back and um and unfortunately just watch those spines but the fruit itself is it's quite tangy it's a little bit on the acidic side very very good source of vitamin c which is exceptionally good for us but also a high source of potassium which regulates the um our abilities uh to to i suppose move moisture and balance our our fluid levels out in our body so if you do suffer from a bit of fluid build up uh, key apple is a great fruit to get your hands on. And you tend to find you can only buy it in markets. It doesn't have a long life shelf lifespan. So you won't find it generally in the big supermarkets. You'll find it more in specialised fruit markets. Uh, so think about that one. We'll head back down to the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria. Hello, Carolyn. You've just purchased daffodil bulbs from Garden Express. What should I do with them when I get them? Well, look, I think David's going to tell us that the best time to plant is really the end of this month is when you should start putting them in they will go really really well um, once you put them in you don't need to do a huge amount although a little bit of soil preparation particularly Mornington Peninsula if you're in those sandy soils I know in that area um, putting some organics some composted organics into the soil putting a little bit of blood and bone or a, 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 a natural fertilizer into the ground just at the moment um, and let it and make sure it's nice and moist let it sort of sit there for the next three to four weeks then plant your daffodil bulbs it won't get any better than that carolyn they'll do really well, well go back up to queensland in bundaberg irene um you've recently heard of a chemical free homemade weed killer one part vinegar to nine parts water i'm wondering uh if that would have any residual effects on the soil would you think it'd be okay to plant into the treated soil soon after spraying? Okay, so that that um, that vinegar spray, uh, if you just want to knock an insect back, I wouldn't worry about mixing too many parts of water. The only reason you do that is that the vinegar, being an acid, will eat its way through the little rubber rings, the O-rings in your sprayer, if you're not careful, because it, it does actually do that. Um, I'm probably thinking that probably one part vinegar to five parts water and I would look at adding uh, probably a tablespoon of salt and you mix the, the three together and then you apply over the foliage. You only want to do that probably once a year. The thing with vinegar is it's acidic and it will acidify the soil. So um, what I would do is I would spray it, let it kill off the, the, the weeds. It'll kill off the majority. It's a contact spray. So anything under the soil uh, could still be alive. And what I would do is I would cultivate the soil. Then I'd think about planting um, new plants into that soil thereafter. Hopefully that helps. Irene, Marilyn, we're not sure where you're from, Marilyn. You've got a lily pilly. It has got lots of little green beetles on it at the moment, and you're wondering if I can help. Um, those little green beetles are highly likely to be something known as the Calypso bug, or more recently, it's been sort of renamed in Australia, the Lily Pilly beetle. Now, the larvae is a little tiny, uh, little slow moving um, insect. And the baby beetles are sort of green. They're about the size of a ladybird, but there's no spots on them. And the trick with them is that you want to try get control of the larvae. Now you can introduce chooks into the garden if you can do that, and, and a bantam uh, hen or two or three, depending on how big your garden, will go through these and get control of them really quickly. These bugs tend to get down in the soil uh, during the night, and then during the day they tend to be active in the plant. Uh, if you want to spray something, neem oil is a really good spray. So neem treatment, fantastic way to go. You can try things like white oil. It's kind of mixed success. I, I'm not sure I can help much more than that. Elsie, um, I share your disappointment. I've had this experience as well. Elsie is in Melbourne. She's got an avocado tree, but it died and she doesn't know why. She's got hard clay soil. Avocados um, do have quite sensitive root systems, albeit a lot of avocado trees do very well in heavy soils. Um, if it gets too hard and too dry, the tree will stress and it'll die. Um, the trick with, with the soil preparation is to try and get a bit of, um, ideally a bit of calcium into the soil. So you do that by way of adding dolomite or gypsum, 
uh, into the soil. If you're in sandy uh, coastal soils, probably gypsum. If you're in heavier soils, uh, dolomite's the best way to go. Prepare the soil, dig it up, get some compost in there. If you get saturation, so waterlogging, plant into a mound. So build, do a big mound, maybe one, one and a half metres wide in a big circle and plant in the top. If you're in dry, sandy soils, then do a furrow and plant in the middle of the of the bottom point of that sort of that uh, bowl, I suppose, you'll create. Um, the trick with them is really to get them through the first two years, maybe three years. Once they're established, they should be fine. But the first year or two is quite the challenge, Elsie. But once you've got it, it is worth every single bit of it. I have got some magnificent avocados at home. We're really excited. We actually, my, my son Harry enjoyed the first one just the other day. Absolutely loved it. Now, Mark, we're not sure where you're from, but you've asked how far you should prune, how far back you should prune your crepe myrtle. Um, crepe myrtles are a pretty tough tree. Generally, you would prune them in the winter and you'd only prune them to shape them. So that's my recommendation as you do that. You can take them back, to be honest, you could cut them back in half if you wanted to. It doesn't matter if it's a big tree, you can do that and it'll uh, it'll do a good job. But the truth of the matter is I'd only prune them to shape them because if you do cut them back too hard, you do potentially ruin flowering for the next season. James is in Mahogany Creek in WA. It's up in the hills. When I go to a garden centre, I get confused by the different types of soil on offer. This is a great question, James. I love this question. Is it okay to use potting mix to plant things out in the garden or is it strictly for pots only? Also, what's the difference between soil conditioner and landscaping mix? Well, the potting mix question, yes, you can use potting mix. It's just more expensive. You should always look for a red tick. So you'll see the Australian standards on the bottom of the bag. You'll have red or black. And if you don't have any, I wouldn't touch that bag of potting mix. But if you have red or black, I would be looking for the red and I would be using that. You can use it in soils, uh, particularly in Mahogany Creek, where you can get some sort of quite hard, coarse, um, poor draining soils. It's probably not a bad thing to use. But um, because of the expense, it's really designed to use in pots where it's got very, very good drainage and also things like wetting agents and controlled release fertilizers. The other question is uh, what's the difference between a soil conditioner and landscaping mix? So a soil conditioner is about building up the soil that you have, your existing soil, and getting a really good mix um, of your current soil and improving the quality of that. And soil conditions can vary from things like animal manures to pre-designed uh, mixes. In fact, um, uh, the mineral magic that uh, that we talk about at the moment, this this um, uh, biogenic amorphic silica, is in, in many ways it's a soil conditioner. It improves the structure and health of the soil, and that makes a big difference. A landscaping mix is when you're putting in new garden beds and you basically want to create a whole new soil structure, you would use a landscaping mix and you'd plant direct into that landscaping mix. Hopefully that answers those questions. Catherine's in success in WA, which is south of Perth. I've been having terrible trouble with spider mites. Now you've tried using neem oil to try and control them. They seem to return. You're doing your best to stay organic. Do I have a hope of ridding the garden of them? Well, I would be looking to biological services. Do a Google on them. Biological services, they're located north of Perth. They produce predatory insects that love eating spider mites. And I would be looking at introducing those. Neem oil will work, but the trouble with the spider mites is they're under the foliage. In fact, this is that really good example I've got here. So you're seeing powdery mildew on the top, but you're seeing a silvering on the bottom. And if you were to get a microscope and have a look under here, you would actually see all these little, little almost like little red dots. And each one of them has got little legs on them and they are a pest and you've got to get control of them because they will do all sorts of damage. And if you don't control them this year, they build up in the soil and the crop and the, the population is bigger next year and the damage is done earlier. So biological services, short term, if you're going to spray with something like neem oil or alternatively, uh, a lot of people use white oil, you've got to spray up under the foliage. So you've actually got to turn your sprayer up. You've got to pump it right up. So you've got a fair bit of pressure in there and you shoot it up in underneath. And what that does is it smothers out and treats the, the pests and it will help you get in, in control. But um, important thing to know is that they tend to have a 10 to 14 day life cycle. So um, they will have laid eggs. And even if you kill all the adults, 
the eggs will hatch in 14 days so you'll see them return so doing a second spray 14 days and i would do a third spray 14 days down the line another 14 days down the line and in six weeks you should not have any insects at all doing any damage hopefully that helps catherine there's lots of different options there for you um, we're going to central Queensland. Sandra, you've got 25 plus year old azaleas planted in your late dad's garden. Now the leaves are very sad looking, very mottled and possibly a spider or some sort of mite. All the azaleas are covered in the same, how can I treat it? I suspect that you've got a, um, a beetle actually that's causing this issue. And there are some systemic treatments that you can get in at your local garden center. Um, if it is red spider mite, the systemic treatments will also do the same thing. It is um, uh, azalea uh, lace bug or beetle is a really common uh, pest this time of the year. And it will kill those, uh, those plants, particularly mature ones, if you don't treat them. So now's the time to act. Get into your local garden center. They're gonna suggest something like uh, Bathroid or one of those treatments. Uh, Bathroid was the one I suggested earlier on also for the, um, for the curl grub. That's uh, what's gonna control that. Our last question, and it goes to Tanya, who's in Sydney. You've got a lemon tree. We wouldn't be a gardening show if we didn't have a lemon question, Tanya. Thank you. It's in a pot. It's not doing great. The soil's compacted. It sounds like to me like it's slumped. How do I keep the soil looking fresh and healthy? Well, the trick with citrus is they're gross feeders. They require a fair amount of food on a regular basis, plus they require a really good balance. So getting a citrus fertilizer is vitally important. And the discussion we had earlier on in the show is a really good example of one that will do the job. The second thing is that if it's in a pot, it's probably time to take it out of the pot and repot it, get some good soil in around those roots. And it's nothing wrong with knocking the soil off the roots and reinvigorating good soil, good, fresh potting mix into that. Um, I'd get my hands on some of that premium grade uh, Osmocote potting mix. You can't go wrong. Well, folks, here we go. We've gone for uh, an hour and eight minutes or so. And we've answered a lot of questions and we've shared a lot of information and advice. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I thoroughly enjoy spending time with you. Uh, I'm going to be heading to Norfolk Island uh, in a week's time to do some work uh, for a TV series we produce called Explore TV. It's a travel series, but I'm hoping to do a little bit of garden stuff while I'm there too. In the meantime, Sue McDougal will step in. So we will be back and she will be doing an amazing job as she always does uh, and it'll be next Tuesday not next Monday there's a public holiday running uh, so next Tuesday at, at uh, midday Australian Eastern Standard Time if you are one of the lucky people who've won a prize this week Lachlan will be reaching out to let you know the good news very soon and they'll be shuttling your way via Australia Post in the near future the Garden Gurus is still running on Channel 9 we are getting towards the end of the season now we've got um, uh, episode coming up this Saturday at 4.30 right across the country um, and remember if you've got something that you missed from last week's show jump onto our website you can catch up on previous stories it's thegardengurus.tv or our YouTube channel thegardengurus.tv is where you can also uh, watch a whole bunch of great uh, content that we've produced and we've produced a lot of content over the 20 years that we've been going Remember, if you've missed out on part of today's show or if you'd like to just listen back, you can listen to the live stream or catching up on previous episodes via Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Audible. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you sometime soon. Hopefully it's next weekend on The Garden Gurus. Um, we'll see you next Tuesday at this point in time at 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time with Sue McDougall. In the meantime, have a great week. I'm Trevor Cochran. We'll see you then. Visit the Garden Guru's online store and browse through a collection of high-quality, German-made wolf garden tools. You'll also find a range of books with information to help create and maintain a beautiful garden. You can also access the online store on the Garden Guru's Facebook page. 